<laughs> All right, gang. Uh, let's go ahead and take this on. This is going to be a bit of a journey that we're going to take for the rest of the hour today. It's going to look like physics. I apologize in advance for that. I'm not going to act like a physics person because they're weird. Hey, <laughs> what's that? Mr. Brown is the only one that's not weird. He's, he's cool and normal. He won't last around this department. Yeah. He'll be on his way out. He'll be uh, moving him on. Anyway, when we talk about gases, now this is going to be a, um, an introduction, a derivation of the ideal gas law. But it's very saturated with physics. And you'll see that as we go through. We make some um, assumptions about the way gas particles behave when we talk about them, we, we describe thing as, as, things as ideal gases. These are the assumptions that we're making about them. First, we assume that the volume of the particles is zero. Now, is the volume of a gas particle really zero? No. No, it has volume. All atoms do and molecules do. It's not big, but it, there, there is volume. We assume that it's zero. And the reason that we assume that it's zero is because, yeah, you got this tiny little molecule or atom, and then way, way, way far away from it is the next one. So compared to the distance in between particles, the size of the molecules themselves or atoms are, are negligible. They just don't have any volume compared to how much space is between them. Now, if you take a gas and you compress it down to a really, really small volume and squash those particles together, that is going to cause them to start to get in each other's way as the volume gets smaller. And then we need to be concerned about their volume. And at that point, the particles are not acting like an ideal gas anymore. So as long as the gas is behaving ideally, the particles are spread apart from each other. They don't get in each other's way. Another assumption that we make is that gas particles are in a constant state of motion. All their collisions are considered elastic. Did you learn about elastic collisions last year or the year before? Yeah. Elastic collision means that uh, when something, uh, when a particle bounces off the wall of its container, it bounces off and it doesn't lose any energy when it does that. If it was not elastic, then eventually the particles would slow down because they'd be losing energy every time they hit something. But well, we know that that's not true. That means that a particle would eventually stop moving. And they don't do that, they just keep moving. So yeah, th when they hit walls of the container, they do exert a force, which is gonna be translated to pressure, and the, uh, um, the collisions are elastic. Number three, there's four, four parts of this kinetic molecular theory. Gas particles have no attractive forces. So what is that? What would what would that do for us? Um, gas particles have no attractive force. That means that the particles, as they get close to each other, are not attracted. They don't tend to stick to each other. Now that's not always true for all gases. Uh, if you have a gas that's made up of polar molecules, like ammonia, ammonia is polar. It's got a, a positive side and negative side. 
Ammonia molecules would attract each other. They got too close to each other, they tend to stick to each other. So ammonia is not a good example of an ideal gas. Now, as long as you keep the temperature high uh, and the particles moving fast enough, they don't really slow down and try to stick to each other. But as you cool a gas down, then the particles, as they cool off, they do tend to, to stick to each other. And so the colder you get a gas, the less ideal it is. So ideal behavior is more uh, about having a higher temperature. So like at room temperature, this is very a good condition for uh, a gas, as long as it's not under too high a pressure, because uh, particles are moving around pretty fast at these uh, temperatures. Last one. Uh, the kinetic energy of a gas is directly related to how fast the particles are moving. And th th that is what kinetic energy is. That's related to temperature. come back and use these components of the kinetic molecular theory as we go through um, this, this derivation. You ready for this? No. Well, okay, we're going to do it anyway. <laughs> we're going to start, what's that? You don't have to, no. We're going to start with a box. Imagine there's one gas particle inside of a box. And the box is going to be cubic in shape, so that all sides are the same length, and we're going to call the length L. That's what? L? As opposed to W? Correct. Sorry to hear this. Anything I can do to help? <laughs> curve the quiz. Curve the quiz. No, curve the quiz. I offered. I gave you a chance. Wait, what? Wait, what? Wait, what? Wait, what? <laughs> curve the quiz. Curve the quiz. Ten percent. So we're starting very simple. We have a single particle inside of a box. Uh, the particle only has one dimensional motion, at least to get us started. So one dimensional means it's going left and right. Boom, 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 just back and forth like that. It's not going up and down, that would be two-dimensional motion. It's not going in and out, that would be three-dimensional motion if it was going up, down, in, left, right, and uh, you know. So uh, it's just going back and forth. Now, the frequency with which this particle hits the walls of the container and goes back and forth is related to a couple of variables. It's directly related to how fast the object is moving. The faster it's moving, the higher the frequency. Or it's inversely related to the size of the box. If we have a big box, then it's not going to bounce off uh, the sides as frequently because it's got farther distance to travel. So we come up with a mathematical relationship. Frequency is defined as collisions per time, for some unit of time. Now, the numerator there, the number of collisions, is not a measurable quantity. It's an occurrence. So uh, the, the numerator really doesn't have a value. We just call it 1. If you remember talking about the light equations in Chem 1, uh, the hertz is the unit of uh, frequency. It's 1 over seconds. Really, it's waves over seconds. The wave is, is just like this. It's the occurrence. That's something you measure with the instrument. So frequency is defined as this, 1 over time. And then that is equal to uh, velocity over size, or, or the length of the, the box. Now remember that this thing is traveling length L, because L is the length of all the sides. We're going to come back to that relationship. I wanted to define that and show you the picture first. Yes, ma'am? Uh, so it's like. Frequency is defined as like the velocity over the length of the, the 
thing. Yeah. The, the side length of the box. So can yes. it be like something like um uh mill milli oh, sorry centimeters per second per centimeter. Yes, which the centimeters cancel out, and you're left with reciprocal seconds. One per That's that's what frequency is. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Physically, it's collisions per second, but mathematically, it's just one over seconds. Collision doesn't have a unit or a, a real point. It's not a quantity. So it's, a, it's a strange concept. It is. Now we're going to move along. This looks like physics. The force with which the particle runs into the wall of the container has been defined by uh, Newton's second law here. The force is equal to the mass of the particle times its acceleration. Now you know what acceleration is, maybe. You know what acceleration is? It's like how fast velocity. Yeah, change in velocity over time. So I've just uh, made a substitution here. Instead of calling it acceleration, I'm calling it change in velocity over time. Yeah, one second. What is ten times the m is the mass, mass of the particle, that gas particle. This second part over here, all I did was I took the mass and put it up in the numerator rather than over to the side of it. It's the exact same thing. All right, we good with that? So what do we do with it? When we talk about a, a change in velocity, velocity is a vector quantity. You learn vectors in math class? Yeah. Vectors have magnitude and they have direction. And even if something stays the same speed but it's changing direction, it's accelerating. If I put a ball on the end of a string and I swing it over my head, even if I'm swinging at the same speed the whole time around, it's constantly changing direction, so I need to constantly exert a force on it. That's acceleration. Now, when we have an elastic collision, remember this particle in the box only has one dimensional motion. It's moving to the left, oops, to the right, and then to the left, and then to the right, and then to the left, just like that. Since we assume from the kinetic molecular theory that the uh, collisions are elastic, that means that the velocity after it bounces off the wall is the same as it was before it bounced into the wall, just with an opposite direction. So that means this, that the final velocity equals negative the initial velocity. The negative because it has changed direction. It's going the opposite direction. Now we know that delta v is delta, means final minus initial. Yes? So that's a change in velocity. We now have a relationship between the final and the initial velocity. Because it's an elastic collision, these two things are equal to each other. Therefore, Vf can be renamed negative Vi. So this thing right here is negative Vi, and then it subtracts Vi. So that's negative 2 vi is the change in velocity. And then putting that back into this uh, equation, that's what we had on the previous slide, force. Now this is, it's, it's not function of x, it's just a force in the x direction. Remember this thing is just going on the x-axis left and right. Mass of the particle times change in velocity over the time. That change in velocity is now going to be replaced with that thing right there. So it's going to be m times negative 2 vi over change in t, which I'm just going to clean this up and pull that constant value out here. Like that. Go ahead. 